Oh, hello, Pema Shuri. Hi, Maitreyi. <laughs> Lovely to see you. And you, and you. So I'm here um, in East London, just around the corner from the London Buddhist Centre, uh, speaking to you from my community, um, of, which is uh, quite a big one, 12 of us all together. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm here in Cambridge um, in a house that uh, my partner and I moved into about 18 months ago. And I'm sitting here in the front room. And of course, my tray, it's lovely to connect with you because our paths go back a long way, don't they? They certainly do, all the way back to the Cherry Orchard restaurant at the LBC, uh, just next door to the LBC. That's right. But, That's yeah. right. So when I arrived um, in the you know to my first encounter with the movement you were um you were managing the cherry orchard i was i was managing the cherry orchard and it's also the place from where you know where i was working and living in a community around the lbc that's where i got ordained as well yes yeah, yeah. yeah. so i yeah. was always um i you know that's you made a strong impression on me at that time wow. Yeah, uh, partly well, you... the way that you manage the restaurant so well, but also the fact that you had that vision of going to India, yes. uh, which I really was inspired by. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was always part of my trajectory to mm. go there at some point. But, you know, I was strongly encouraged to wait until I was ordained to do it. I was ready to jump and go out there straight away. But uh, yeah. Bant said, no, wait till you're ordained. Yeah, and when I say your vision of going to India, of course, it wasn't just to travel. You were going to live and work in India. That's right. For the yeah. movement, with the movement. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So here we are talking about the mythic context in our lives. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you yeah, know, it's interesting because I think you and I have got very different you know, conditioning, you know, my conditioning is such, you know, I was brought up a Christian, a practicing Christian, my father's an Anglican clergyman, and um, th th there's something about um, a mythic context, which in a way I think I grew up with, you know, I wouldn't have used that language, mm. and I suppose I could say, you know, perhaps God was part of that, um, you know, having some higher purpose was in there. Uh, mm. But mm. what about you? Because, you know, I certainly remember conversations with you yeah. and you have a very different background. Yeah, so I come from a very uh, completely non-religious background. In a way, religion, you could say, was a bit like the opium of the people in my, <laughs> in my yeah. upbringing. And, um, yeah, a, a, a very much a, a socialist and, a, and atheist background. Mm. Um, mm. So that um, you know, my uh, my coming to the Dharma um, was very much to do with um, my sort of koan about what is the meaning of life and looking for meaning and truth, mm. uh, which I you know found um, in Buddhism. Mm. Um, but do you remember that conversation we had uh, many years ago? At uh, we were both at Tiratnaloka, and we were walking by the river. I do, I do. Um, yeah, and I remember just saying to you that while I had always thought that it was a beneficial for me that I didn't have God in my life, as it were, um, in terms of coming to the Dharma, um, I also realized that I felt an envy, an envy, uh, envious yeah. of your, what seemed to me to be having um, a sort of inbuilt sense of, um, of a, a beneficent forces in yeah. the universe, which I just didn't have. Yeah, yeah, no, I certainly remember that conversation well. I remember the walk. I even remember where we stopped at a little gate and had that conversation. Yeah. Um, and yes, and in a way, I think, you know, I suppose we can so often take aspects of our conditioning for granted. And mm -hmm. I realized, you know, when you pointed that out, you know, from, about me that that was true that was kind of almost innate in innate in my being and my upbringing yeah, um, yeah. of course when I came across Buddhism it wasn't necessarily so easy and I remember difficult conversations with my mother saying so you know as a Buddhist you don't believe in God so does that make you an atheist and I said <laughs> Mm, I've never really thought of it like that and I said well well no I don't think so mm. and I didn't really have the language then but what I realized was that actually 
there still was something very much other, uh, which, you know, now I poss possibly use the language of the transcendental, something more other, which wasn't God, but I couldn't really describe it. But I think in a way Buddhism has over the years very much, you know, in a way so rich in meaning and symbol and um, truth through mm. those symbols. And mm. Mm. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So where did it kind of go from there, Pabashuri, do you think? Um, well, uh, I suppose, you know, one of one of the myths that spoke very strongly to me actually was the myth of Tara, Tara being born from the tears of Avalokiteshvara. Mm. And uh, that spoke very strongly. And, you know, Tara is active. She's active, a, a the female form. So I could respond very closely to that. And then she's active in the world and she has this, you know, one leg up in meditation, the stillness of that, and then the other stepping out into the world. And uh, that was that was a bit of a myth of my life. You know, I, I wanted to be active in the world, but I didn't necessarily have the stillness. And interestingly, one of the things, Banti, when I took up the sadhana of mm -hmm. Green Tara at my ordination, one of the things Banti said to me, because I'd probably had conversations with him about compassion, compassionate activity, the Bodhisattva ideal, all those spoke strongly. And he said, well, of course, Tara embodies wisdom as well as compassion. Mm. And that's something I've reflected on a lot over the years. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, yeah. well, I guess I guess my way in was um, was really, you know, given my conditioning was through the historical Buddha. Oh, right. Yeah. I remember on one very early solitary retreat, I had uh, Nyanamoli's Life of the Buddha with me and oh, I read a section from it every, every day after I'd eaten my lunch. Yeah. And it yeah. really just, uh, it was a long solitary and it just really seeped in, permeated my mind, I think, yeah. <laughs> at the time. Yeah. And then through the historical Buddha, I could re I could respond to the, the well, particularly to the mandala of the five jinnas. Yes. You know, the fact that they were all aspects of the enlightened mind. Yes. And again, as you say, they had such color. Yeah. Richness, um, yes. So much to each figure. Each and I figure. Think yeah. Each figure. Yes. Yeah. So that, um, it, you know, my way into so the Sambhogakaya. Uh, to put it in those terms, yes. was through the five jinnas and and Vajrasattva, right. is the embodiment of all the jinnas, of course. <laughs> right, right, yes, yeah, yeah. And obviously, you know, we talk about the mythic context in the movement and the order. Um, and, you know, I suppose we all have our personal myths, and in a way, I think you and I have just yes. touched on that a bit. Uh, but then there's also the collective myth, isn't there? And I know you had quite a big vision about... Um, Akashavana. Uh, yes, yes, say something yes, about that. Yeah. yeah, well, just maybe just before that, I could just mention, um, you know, um, the thousand armed Avalokiteshvara as the myth of the order. Right. Uh, which was something that inspired me very strongly that it, there was Avalokiteshvara who, in a way, had tried to go it alone. Um, and then, uh, despite all his efforts, he kind of hit a wall and you could say cracked up, broke into a thousand pieces. <laughs> Yeah. And Amitabha came and put him together with a thousand arms and eleven heads, uh, you know, being able to hear the cries of the world. Mm. And, um, and in a way, he was then fit for purpose with all these different arms going out into the world. Mm. Mm. And, um, you know, I was always very struck by Bante saying that we should take that image, not just symbolically, but literally. Yes, um, yes, yes, uh, as so, so that we are, we yeah. are Avalokiteshvara, the order is at our best, at our best, yes, we are best. Avalokiteshvara yes. in the world, and that is such an amazing vision. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but yes, and then, you know, and then we both have been very involved with um, the myth of ordination in yes. terms of our work as preceptors. And uh, but also we've both been very um, involved with Akashavana, yes, dedicated women's retreat center for ordination retreats in Spain. So you yeah. say a bit about that, Pabashuri, because yeah. yeah, that's well, it's a big it, part of your life. It became a big part of my life. I mean, I never realized it would at the time. I mean, I was very much behind the project. You know, I'd been involved in quite a number of women's ordination retreats in different 
places, often hired places, Il Convento, all wonderful. And, and even a, an international one in India where Western women and Indian women came together to be ordained. Um, but then once we got a Kashivana, you know, I actually for all sorts of circumstances, I found myself leading a number, of, you know, year after year of the long three month ordination retreat for women. And uh, Akashavana itself, you know, the name means the forest retreat, there are a lot of trees, of luminous space. Mm -hmm. So to me, it has the darkness of the forest, you know, even that's symbolic, mm -hmm. you know, the deep, the deep, dark forest and the luminosity of space and those coming together and a union of opposites in that. But then the whole, all the themes that happen on ordination retreat. In a way, you know, if I looked from the outside, I might think I get a bit bored doing that again and again, mm -hmm. but I didn't. I never did. The themes are so rich in themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think watching women going forth, going towards ordination, you know, they've all done so much training. They arrive at Akashivana and uh, then we go through these themes together. We live together. We knock around together and mm -hmm. we do practice at, yeah. its, yeah. at its best together. Yeah. And it's you know, very enriching. Yeah, and of course, and of course, at Akashavana we have the mandala of the five Buddhas. We do. It's, it's as it were there all the time, but as part of the early ritual of the retreat, we reveal the mandala of the five Buddhas to ourselves, and um, that's just such a wonderful context. And yeah. we're both going to be there, uh, we hope, <laughs> next year in the autumn to uh, to co-lead a, a retreat on six element practice and sadhana yeah uh, and the mandala of the five buddhas will be a very significant part of that as well it will it yeah. will yeah okay my tray great lovely to talk to you and to you and to you yeah, yeah.